Welcome to Class with Cassiniti. Today, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. Before we begin, I should say that The Things They Carried is actually Tim O'Brien's novel about soldiers and experiences in Vietnam. The selection that we have in our textbook is merely an excerpt from that novel. Uh, however, it is a longer selection, so I will divide this um, discussion into two parts. Uh, I feel that will give us enough time to adequately discuss the material that we have. So, to begin, the things they carried. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping. The letters weighed 10 ounces. At dusk, he would carefully return the letters to his rucksack, slowly, a bit distracted. He would get up and move among his men, checking the perimeter, then at full dark he would return to his hole and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. So from this first bit of the selection, we learn a few things. First of all, Jimmy Cross is a lieutenant, which means that he is the commanding officer of this platoon of soldiers in Vietnam. And it even says that he would get up and move among his men. So he is responsible for the welfare of these men. Secondly, we learn of his continuing interest and fascination with a girl at home named Martha. Now, it is clear to us from the narration that this is not a romantic relationship. Uh, Jimmy Cross uh, seems to hope that maybe one day it might be a romantic relationship, but he realizes now at this point in time that Martha is not particularly interested in him uh, in that way. Uh, however, the letters, and later we learn the photos, are of value to him because they represent a connection to something at home which leads us to this dis dis discussion about his uh, obsessive contemplation about whether Martha is a virgin. Now, in one sense, it's quite natural uh, for a young man to perhaps wonder about these things. Uh, remember, we learn later that Jimmy Cross is merely 24 years old. He's young, uh, and it's probably natural to wonder about a potential love interest, you know, what has been their relationships before, what has been their experience in those relationships. But I do think that it is also something deeper, that the idea of virginity is the idea of purity, the idea of innocence, the idea that something is unspoiled, is untouched, and Remember, Martha is at home. Martha is back in the States, a world away from the jungles of Vietnam. Uh, she is, for all intents and purposes, a virgin. She is unspoiled. She is innocent of the knowledge of what is happening in the jungles of Vietnam and what the soldiers are experiencing there. And Jimmy Cross is very much in that world. He is very much a young man who has found himself in a world and a circumstance not of his own making. And he has already, at his very young age, uh, been confronted with uh, very trying experiences and circumstances and also bears a great weight of responsibility because he is the leader, he is the commanding officer of this group of soldiers. Now our narrator gives us the first criteria for uh, the things they carry. The things they carried were largely determined by necessity. So the first thing is just sort of the, um, the regulation gear that each soldier is given. Um, can openers, pocket knives, wristwatches, dog tags, mosquito repellent, 
chewing gum, cigarettes, uh, lighters, matches, sea rations, canteens of water. I mean, this is the this is the basic kind of equipment that you would expect a soldier would have and take into um, a mission. And our narrator tells us that these items weigh between 15 and 20 pounds. But remember, the things they carry are determined by necessity. Now, for each man, he has a different necessity. For Lieutenant Cross, one of the necessities is carrying these letters and photos of Martha. For another soldier, uh, such as Henry Dobbins, he's a big man, so he carries extra rations. Uh, Dave Jensen is particularly concerned with hygiene, so he carries extra toothbrush and dental floss. Ted Lavender was scared. So by necessity, he carries something to allay the fear. Ted Lavender was scared, so he carried tranquilizers. And then later it says Ted Lavender was scared. He carried several ounces of marijuana, which for him was a necessity. Uh, Kiowa, our American Indian soldier, carries an illustrated New Testament, but as a hedge against bad times, he also carried his grandmother's distrust of the white man. So he carries his grandfather's old hunting hatchet. So by necessity, Kiowa is marrying the, the new with the old. Uh, the one culture with the other culture. Um, necessity dictated. So um, they also carry, uh, because the land was mined and booby-trapped, booby it was SOP, standard operating procedure, for each man to carry steel-centered, nylon-covered flak jacket, which adds another almost seven pounds to the weight of things that they carry. To carry something was to hump it. And I think it's very important to recognize that expression, to hump it. The very notion of that idea indicates to us that it is an effort, it is an exertion to hump it. It is heavy. It is tiring. Uh, and this will become a recurring idea throughout the selection that it is exhausting to deal with all of this equipment and to deal with all of this weight of what these soldiers carry. Now we get to the second criteria. What they carried was partly a function of rank, number three, partly of field specialty. And now each of these soldiers has additional items that they carry that is based on their rank and their job within the platoon. But Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried 34 rounds. He went down under an exceptional burden, more than 20 pounds of ammunition, plus the flat jacket and helmet and rations and water and tranquilizers and all the rest, plus the unweighted fear. So early on, Ted Lavender, we are told, is carrying not only the 20 pounds of standard issue gear, but he's carrying an additional 20 pounds of ammunition with the tranquilizers, with the marijuana, and the unweighted fear. So early on, our narrator is trying to communicate to us that these men carry physical items that have physical weight and physical gravity, but these men also carry psychological burdens that do not have a specific weight and yet are heavy and oppressive along with the, the equipment. Um, Lieutenant Cross kept to himself and he keeps to himself partly because he is so often daydreaming about Martha and the thoughts that he has about her. 
the narrator tells us they carried all the, in addition to the three standard weapons, they carry more weapons. They carried all they could bear and then some, including a silent awe for the terrible power of the things they carried. And then Lieutenant Cross adds to his burden, Martha sends him a good luck charm, a simple pebble, an ounce at most. Um, she had found the pebble on the Jersey shoreline. Again, Lieutenant Cross is try seeking this connection with something that is from home, a connection with something that is f from Martha, um, but also that is not from Vietnam, not of this experience that he's living right now. His mind wandered. He had difficulty keeping his attention on the war. Again, the constant temptation for him to be distracted and to be daydreaming. What they carried varied by mission, the fourth criteria. Um, if a mission seemed ex especially hazardous or if it involved a place they knew to be bad, they carried everything they could. Other missions were more complicated and required special equipment. Now, my knowledge of military operations and uh, military uh, procedure is extremely limited. My knowledge of the specifics of the Vietnam War is even much more limited than my knowledge of the military. Uh, but what I do understand about Vietnam in particular is for the soldiers, it was long periods of very tedious moving and marching through the jungle, uh, punctuated by periods of intense action. So soldiers could go for days, for weeks, where they're simply marching from location to location uh, with very little... Uh, concretely to accomplish and yet sometimes they would find themselves in the middle of very intense action or fighting and one of the things that distinguished the Vietnam War from other engagements is the Viet Cong built a very very elaborate tunnel system as a way to move men and equipment through the jungle without being detected by soldiers on the ground. And so a lot of effort was spent by American troops to try to destroy these tunnels and destroy the Viet Cong's, Viet Cong's ability to move men and supplies through the jungle. But this was extremely dangerous work. Uh, because you can appreciate that if you are entering into a tunnel, you do not know what you will encounter. Uh, you may, in, in fact, encounter uh, soldiers. And just from a defensive position, it's a very vulnerable position. You're coming into the tunnel, you have no idea what you will face, and the uh, men who are who are there uh, really have the advantage. So clearing these tunnels was extremely dangerous. And this is one of the missions that is assigned to Jimmy Cross and his platoon is to clear out some of these tunnels. So apparently they take turns being the first guy down that tunnel looking around to see what is there. Um, and it says on April 16th, Lee Strunk drew the number 17. He laughed and muttered something and went down quickly. Mitchell Sanders said, you win some, you lose some. Sometimes you settle for a rain check. It was a tired line and no one laughed. I mean, again, uh, these are men who are trying to cope under extremely difficult circumstances. Notice, however, what... Uh, Lieutenant Cross is doing. Lieutenant Cross moved to the tunnel, leaned down, and examined the darkness. Trouble, he thought. A cave-in, maybe. And then suddenly, without willing it, he was thinking about Martha. Kneeling, watching the hole, 
He tried to concentrate on Lee Strunk and the war, the dangers, but his love was too much. He felt paralyzed. And again, any of us can, can appreciate that this is a, a situation of extreme stress uh, and extreme danger for all of them. But Jimmy Cross's go-to place is to check out, to mentally escape. He said, without, um, it said, uh, without willing it, he was thinking about Martha. He, he, he just simply exits the present. But while he's doing that, while he's doing that, Lieutenant Cross gazed, gazed at the tunnel, but he was not there. He was with Martha under the white sand at the Jersey Shore. He was just a kid in war, in love. He was 24 years old. He couldn't help it. And we feel sympathy. We recognize this even in ourselves. He's young. He's facing unimaginable challenges and unimaginable, unimaginable responsibility. Uh, and any of us might check out in the same way. The problem is that while he's doing that, Ted Lavender was shot in the head on his way back from the latrine. Here's the situation. When they go in to check out one of these tunnels, not only is there the possibility that there are soldiers, there are enemy soldiers in those tunnels, but there's also the possibility that there are enemy soldiers in the vicinity. Remember, these tunnels are a way to move through the jungle. So while you're clearing out the tunnel, you need to be focused on the danger of the tunnel, but you also need to be focused on the danger of your environment. And because Jimmy Cross checks out and starts to daydream about Martha Cross, he's not checked in to what his men are doing and what their environment and circumstances are. And so Ted Lavender leaves the group and apparently doesn't say anything to anyone, just simply wanders off and is shot as he is uh, separated from the group. Um, and this becomes a significant event for Jimmy Cross because in essence, he's lost one of his men. And as the commanding officer, the responsibility for that falls on him. All right, the things they carried were determined to some extent by superstition. And again, we see that Jimmy Cross carries this pebble that Martha has sent him. Uh, Dave Jensen carries a rabbit foot. Norman Bowker carries the thumb of a Vietnamese boy that the soldiers find dead. The boy wore black shorts and sandals. At the time of his death, he had been carrying a pouch of rice, a rifle, and three magazines of ammunition. The philosopher of the group... Mitchell Sanders, the, who gave us the uh, memorable, you win some, you lose some, and sometimes you, you settle for a rain check. The philosopher says, there's a definite moral here. And he insists that there's a definite, mor there's a definite moral with this. There's a definite moral with, with this young boy. Um, and the question is, what is the moral? And no one seems to have an answer. Um, but if you look a few paragraphs later, our, our narrator tells us the resources were stunning. Sparklers for the 4th of July, colored eggs for Easter. It was the great American war chest. They carried it all on their backs and shoulders. And for all the ambiguities of Vietnam, all the mysteries and unknowns, there was at least the single abiding certainty that they would never be at a loss for things to carry. And I, as a reader, wonder if that is the moral 
that Sanders may be pointing to with this with this uh, young boy that they discover. This boy is carrying a bag of rice and he's carrying a weapon. Symbolically, he's carrying food and protection. And yet, and yet, it doesn't save him. He is still killed. Uh, so the things that these soldiers carry, it isn't really enough to prevent what may be the inevitable. Um, the war was entirely a matter of posture and carriage. The hump was everything, a kind of inertia, a kind of emptiness, a dullness of desire and intellect, conscience, hope, human sensibility. <clears throat> Our narrator tells us that they share the weight of memory. They took up what others could no longer bear. Often they carried each other, the wounded or the weak. After the chopper took Lavender away, Jimmy Cross led his men into the village of, uh, I'm guessing at the pronunciation, led him into the village of Tan Ki. Uh, they burned everything. And in essence, they punished the village for the death of Ted Lavender. Um, Lieutenant Cross felt himself trembling. He felt shame. He hated himself. He had loved Martha more than his men, and as a consequence, Lavender was now dead. This was something he would have to carry like a stone in his stomach for the rest of the war. In part, he grieved for Ted Lavender, but mostly it was for Martha, for himself, because she belonged to another world. She, he realized she did not love him and never would. And now he is stuck with the intangible weight of the burden of the guilt for what has happened to Ted Lavender. This is the end of part one.